Democratic lawmakers unveiled a new economic recovery plan on Thursday. It's called the Thrive Agenda. The resolution was designed to tackle what Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer called a, quote, collision of crises. That includes mass unemployment, racial injustice, the pandemic, and climate change. If anyone needed any proof of how disastrously and quickly climate change is affecting our globe, look out west. Right now, millions of Americans are witnessing climate change in the ash and orange skies outside their windows. These catastrophic events have instigated and exacerbated climate change, and they're not new, nor is the upheaval that uh, they cause that disproportionately affects the most vulnerable of communities. God willing, I become majority leader next year. You can be sure we'll make it a top priority to pass a just economic renewable bill following the principles of Thrive to confront climate change, economic inequality, and racial justice. Congresswoman Deb Holland introduced the act in the House, and she joins me now. She's a Democrat representing New Mexico's 1st District. Congresswoman, it's great to have you with us. So the Thrive Agenda aims to tackle climate change. Oh, well, uh, let's—I'm so interested in jumping right into this with you. So you're tackling climate change, racial injustice, economic inequality, the pandemic altogether. Let's be direct, Congresswoman. Congressional Republicans and Democrats can't even agree on an amount to, to give out to Americans who are suffering from unemployment right now. What hope does the Thrive Agenda actually have in the current Congress? Thank you so much, Lana. I could have saved that until now. Um, so look, one of the things that uh, Leader Schumer said in his remarks today was when he is majority leader uh, after, you know, next year, uh, that this is absolutely something that he is going to move forward. Um, and yes, the collision of crises, overlapping crises, the Thrive Agenda, it presents a bold economic renewal plan that puts millions of people back to work uh, in a more just, healthy and equitable society. Uh, this pandemic has shown, uh, has highlighted the disparities in so many communities across our country. Um, so we, we want to, we think we can protect our planet from the threat of climate change, create good union jobs, invest in frontline communities, and empower and lift up people all at the same time. And uh, it's going, it's urgently needed economic recovery. We've seen that, uh, you're, you know, the piece you just had on, people having to live with their parents so they can, so they can get past this terrible health crisis. Um, and so I just feel very strongly that this, our Thrive Resolution, um, it'll lay the groundwork to create millions of good, safe jobs with access to unions. We want folks to be able to, um, to have the pay, a living wage, and the benefits that they deserve so they can support their families and uh, move forward in, in a new, really great economy. But I, I just, I guess I want to be clear on this, Congresswoman. Are you expecting that you will get any support from Republicans, or does this plan solely hinge on the idea that Democrats will win control of the Senate, maintain control of the House, and possibly, necessarily, really, get control of the White House as well? So let me put it this way. Um, right now, we can't afford not to act. We can't afford not to do anything. We have to be, uh, we would love for Republicans to join this bill, of course. And I've spent my, uh, my term so far, almost two years working across the aisle uh, to pass bipartisan legislation. And we've done a lot of that. Um, we, it'd be wonderful if some Republicans uh, joined us on the on this Thrive Agenda. Um, I think there are Republicans in districts right now who are experiencing uh, this health care crisis that exacerbates the economic crisis, that exacerbates, um, you know, so many other things. Uh, and so I have to believe that they could see the value in a Thrive Agenda as well. Uh, it's not, I mean, this isn't going to stop us from reaching out, reaching across the aisle, talking to our 
um, to our colleagues about the Thrive Agenda. And I, I just, I think it's a win situation for everyone in this country. I like your optimism. I don't imagine that there's a lot of Republicans lining up to be co-sponsors, but I like the optimism. Uh, let's talk about um, about part of the agenda. A big part of it is investing in underserved communities. I know you've dedicated uh, your your time and your career to, to that issue. Talk to us a little bit more about the significance of this for you. Sure. Well, uh, you know, part of the Thrive Resolution is to invest in black, brown, and indigenous communities to build power and counteract racial and gender injustice. Um, part of that is, um, you know, strengthening and healing the government-to-government -government relationship with uh, sovereign Indian nations. Uh, right now, of course, the, the government, the federal government has a trust responsibility to Indian tribes. It's, you know, it's always a struggle. I mean, even during this pandemic, it was difficult to uh, get funding to tribes um, when you have an administration that doesn't believe that they should have funding. Um, so, so, I mean, what we'd like to do is from the ground up, make sure that uh, we are thinking about the earth first, uh, that, we, uh, that we can ensure that, you know, workers have fairness uh, in, in, in communities that have been ravaged by uh, economic and environmental crises, that we are paying attention to those communities, that we are investing in those communities, and that folks uh, who live there have the opportunities for the jobs that will build those communities back up. It's reinvesting in public institutions that enable workers and communities to thrive. Uh, uh, and look, we we have a huge, uh, we have brought a broad coalition of support all over the country. In fact, today at the at our uh, press conference, uh, folks were streamed in from from all over the country talking about how they support this: the Sunrise Movement, the Sierra Club, Movement for Black Lives, Working Families Party. Uh, there are people all over the country who see the value in the Thrive Act. So we expect to get a tremendous amount of support for it. And I mean, look, we always have to be optimistic. We always have to be positive. Um, if you have to have hope in this job, and I absolutely do. Well, Native American communities have been especially affected by the coronavirus. And I don't think that we've heard as much about uh, those communities struggling uh, and, and fighting the pandemic. Um, why do you believe that is? And how can the government actually help in a greater way um, your your community? Sure. Well, there, there yes. Uh, New Mexico, I'll just use New Mexico for, for an example. We, we're about 11% of the population, and at one time we were over 50% of the positive COVID, COVID cases. Um, it's, it's because Indian country lacks infrastructure. I mean, there are some communities uh, who don't have running water or their water's polluted. And when you are in a respiratory disease where you're having to wash your hands all the time, that's a difficult thing to achieve when you don't have running water. Um, I've talked to Indian tribes, uh, governmental systems who are still on dial-up because they don't have broadband internet service. Kids who are all huddling, you know, native kids are all huddling around the outside of a library just to get internet service so they can do their homework. Um, these are these are foundational uh, things that uh, that everybody should have access to. In 2020, every community should have access to communication. Um, and right now, looking at the lack of broadband internet service in Indian country, uh, think of the perhaps the the folks who live 80, 90, 100 miles away from a hospital or clinic uh, could be using telehealth to get past this terrible health crisis. I mean, there are so many things that we need. Um, and the federal government, as I said, has a trust responsibility. It's time for, for the federal government to step up to make sure that tribes have the funding they need for running water, for internet service, 
Uh, part of that is going to be uh, part of that. We're working very hard to make sure that uh, Native communities answer the census. That's that's an important piece of all of this is is making sure that we have accurate counts so that we can see where the resources need to go. Congresswoman, do you think that the recent racial protests um, have shined a spotlight on the issue of Native populations and um, have given greater support uh, to some of the problems that you're outlining? I absolutely. You know, I feel so strongly that these uh, that the protests that have been happening for the last several months in our country, they have involved so many communities, communities of color, I mean, and communities of, of not of color. So many people have joined together. I feel like it's it's somewhat of a moment of reckoning in our country for anyone who thought that, um, you know, that, that um, uh, racial injustice was over. It's clearly not, uh, because we've seen that uh, it, on our television screens time after time. Um, and so, yes, I think that Native folks have, have been able to um, uh, join in this moment of reckoning that our country is going through and highlight the issues that they are going through. Uh, you know, s some of the most polluted areas in our country, I, at my Laguna Pueblo, uh, we were home to the largest open pit uranium mine in the entire world. Uh, and uranium just blew around for years and years, and people got sick from it. Um, we are all, you know, we are all working, I think, at this point together to make sure that we can acknowledge these issues so that we can heal ourselves, that we can move forward in, in a better America. And that's absolutely what I am working every single day for. And that's actually what our Thrive Resolution is about. Before I let you go, Congresswoman, I just want to touch on the new book by legendary journalist Bob Woodward. It claims that President Trump admitted to publicly downplaying the severity of the coronavirus threat and, based on audio recordings of their interviews, may have known how deadly it was as early as February. What's your take on this? Well, it's heartbreaking to, to know that our president knew, knew how deadly the virus was and that he lied to the American people. Uh, it, it's heartbreaking that under his watch, uh, America has had the worst, we've had the worst coronavirus outbreak in the entire world. Nearly 200,000 people have died in this country with more cases coming. And, um, and, it, and it is, it, I'll have to say that I'm not surprised. Um, if you recall, even after he knew and admitted to himself how deadly this virus was, he was still calling it a democratic hoax. There is, there is video feed to remind us of how many times he essentially lied to, to the public. Um, he has given a failed response to this coronavirus. Many lives have been lost uh, when they didn't need to be lost. And I'll tell you, um, there are people's lives who have changed because of this. And, and um, my heart goes out to every single person who has lost someone, every single person who has a parent in, a, in an assisted living home who, uh, who can't, hasn't been able to visit them for months and months. Um, it, it is... It, one thing as simple as uh, a, a, a countrywide mask mandate would have done wonders to curb this virus. And instead of that, um, we have a president who has held large rallies, super spreader events. In fact, there was one on the White House lawn not too long ago. Uh, people have lost their jobs. They've lost their family members. They have lost their ability to um, to to thrive. They they have lost so much, and it didn't have to be so that much. way. All right, Representative Deb Holland, so appreciate you coming on. Thank you.